I want to take a break from my usual highly practical writing advice today. It's raining outside, it's starting to get a bit cold, I've got some tea. I want to tell you a story about how I squandered the opportunity to be traditionally published through a series of unfortunate choices and wrong turns. Just quickly, before I go into that, in my last video I asked if you wanted a Discord server so that this community has somewhere to talk about writing besides just the YouTube comment section and the response was really positive, so thanks for that. I've set up a Discord server, the link's in the description below. Anyone can join, so feel free to come and chat if you want or feel free to totally ignore this if you prefer, that's fine too. So, story time. Hopefully, if your aim is traditional publishing or it's further down the line your aim for the future is traditional publishing, then you might be able to take something away from this that might help you when you get there. And if traditional publishing isn't your aim at all, you still might be able to take something away from this that's going to be valuable to you. The story then. Let's go back to 2014. At this point, I'd written a couple of short stories and I'd managed to get a flash fiction shortlisted in the Bridport Flash Fiction Prize, but that was all I'd really written so far. I was enjoying writing flash fiction and short stories, but I knew I wanted to write a novel. I'd started one at university and never really got past about 10,000 words, but this time I thought, this is the time to do it. Around that time, I'd read and really enjoyed Submarine by Joe Dunthorne and The Perks of Being a Wallflower by Stephen Chbosky, and something kind of came together in my mind. A character came to me that I knew was a teenage character, but it wasn't really going to be a young adult book or anything like that. But Something came to me. I knew it was going to be first person, really character driven and told through a series of diary entries or journal entries. I started typing because that's all it was at that point, I was just typing. And more and more of this story started to come to me. There wasn't a huge amount of plot but it was funny. Maybe it was touching in a couple of places. I was happy with it. I cracked right on. I was writing a novel. I was really happy about it. So at some point as I'm writing this book, I remembered about the Bridport Prize and I thought, well, they liked my flash fiction a few years ago. I wonder what else they do. So I looked up the, the competition and I could see it was the first year that they were advertising a first novel prize. I entered the first 8,000 words or so and if I got through to the long list, I'd have to send a bit more, but I'd be ready for that when the time came. So I sent my entry in and I forgot all about it, didn't even think about it. Only joking, I obsessively followed the prize on Twitter for months, hoping to see some kind of hint that I was gonna have some success with it. But eventually I did calm down a little bit. At this point, the summer of 2014 had rolled in and I'd finished my book. It was about 63,000 words, it didn't have much of a plot at all, but I liked it and it was finished. Then one day, I got an email. The Bridport Prize wanted to see 10,000 more words of my novel because I'd made the long list for the first novel prize. Now, as I still do, I was working full time then in a day job and I was just about figuring out that writing was what I really wanted to do. So naturally, when I got that email, I considered it to be a sign from the universe. I hovered over the links in that email to check they were genuine. I actually thought I might have been getting scammed. But I wasn't, so I sent the other 10,000 words, or however many they asked for, off for the long listing. And in the meantime, I started writing another book. This one was going to be a proper book, though. This one was going to be crime. I was very heavily influenced by True Detective at the time. It was going to be that mixed with something else. I had this idea of a plot involving some kind of cult in rural America and I was quite excited about it. It was it was the first time I was going to use third person with multiple perspectives. I'd never tried to do that before and it had a, some kind of plot that was coming to me that I was having to get down and, and work out. So I just kept writing that as I waited for the results of the competition to come back and eventually they did and I hadn't made it to the shortlist of the, the first novel prize but I was more than happy to have made it to the long list on my first novel for something that was not really what I would consider to be a novel today, it was just more a bunch of blog entries. But it had made it that far and I was really happy about that. What I should have done at this point was edited that book to make it better, give it a stronger plot, more characters, that kind of thing. I should have built on the skeleton that I had and made that a fully fleshed out book. Instead what I did was think that if it was okay enough to get to the long list of the first novel prize then maybe I could get it published. So I set out to find myself a literary agent and I bought myself a copy of the Writers and Artists yearbook, which if you're based in the UK is a useful resource. It's basically a list of all the literary agents in the UK and some international ones as well. And what they ask for, what they're looking for, 
and how to approach them essentially. So I went through that with a highlighter and I drew circles around the agents or the agencies that I thought might like my book. I looked at what genres they took and what they represented, who they represented, what books I'd heard of that they'd represented and drew my little circles. Then I wrote some query emails and I sent them off, which sounds really simple, but honestly, it took me days and days to write these drafts. A lot longer than any page of my book. I researched what I needed to say to appear professional and what I wanted to avoid saying. I wanted to make sure I came across in the, exactly the right way. But when it came down to it, I knew I wasn't arrogant about my writing, even if I was floating on a little bit of perhaps undeserved confidence at that point, I knew I wasn't an idiot, so I wasn't going to say something really wrong. I didn't think I knew it all by any means. Still, quite obviously don't. So I thought I'd be okay. But I was still nervous to press send on these queries. I was so in awe of these industry professionals who knew everything about books that, and I didn't know that, so it took me a long time to work up the nerve to finally hit the send button. And while those emails were off in the ether somewhere, I was looking up book publishing trends and trying to get more clued up about the industry that I was apparently now trying to break into. Meanwhile, I was still writing that crime book that I'd just started as well. And one afternoon, I was home from work on holiday or a personal day, and I got an email. It was from a literary agent. She said she really enjoyed reading the sample of my novel that I'd sent to her, which was the one that got shortlisted, which I'd made sure to mention. I read the email, I don't know, six or seven times before I did anything else. There were good points and bad points to the email, but I was still elated that a literary agent was taking me seriously at all. She said she laughed at the funny parts and she really loved the voice of my first person character, but that ultimately the book was too similar to The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime by Mark Haddon. Not sure if you've ever read it, but it was pretty big here in the UK. It's been developed into a play and all sorts now. I hadn't read it at the time, um, so I hadn't been influenced by it, but when I did read it, yeah, I saw what she meant. It had a plot, which mine didn't, but other than that, the, the tone was pretty similar. So I was kind of bummed. But then she said, what else she got? And by the way, I specialise in crime. Oh really? I said. Just so happens, I'm writing my first crime novel as we speak. She wanted to take a look at what I had so far and she said, don't worry if it's rough. It was. But I sent it. She replied again. She said she loved it. She said, congratulations on some terrific writing. As you can imagine, I was elated again. She said, keep writing this, finish it, and then once it's done, if it's all to the same standard, I'll sign you up as a client and we'll find you a publisher. What I didn't know then is that this arrangement is called a revise and resubmit deal or an R&R &R deal. Basically what it is, is the agent saying, I see something in you, but this project isn't quite there. If you can change this, improve that, finish this, then we've got a deal. That was more than good enough for me. It was a light at the end of the tunnel. I was working full time still, as I said, and I was coming home every night for like two or three hours and just solidly writing and figuring out the plot. And I was enjoying writing this book now. Even more motivation than that, I felt like I had a reason to write it now. Someone was waiting on this book and I needed to finish it quickly. If you just heard alarm bells then, yeah. I didn't at the time. I was supposed to send the agent regular updates, which I did, and I was writing very quickly, so quickly that she commented on how quickly I was writing, in fact. We talked on the phone, we emailed back and forth, I was supposed to just keep sending her chapters for her to review, and I kept doing that. And then she got back to me. Before, she said, congratulations on some terrific writing. This time she said, yeah, I like the premise and the, the idea you've got and everything, I'm just not so sure about the setting. The rural setting? I asked. No, the fact that it's set in the UK and you're British, she said. Hmm. Maybe you can tell me, actually, subscribers and viewers. Since most of my audience is US-based, would it bother you to read a story set in the US by a British author? And the other way around, if you're UK-based, would it bother you to see a, a story set in this country by a US author? It's a contentious question and it's not one that I think I have the answer to, so let me know what you think in the comments below. Anyway, she wanted to change the setting to the UK, which I really wasn't happy about. Like I said before, it was largely influenced by True Detective and I didn't feel like changing it to the UK. I could do that while keeping the spirit of what I was trying to do with it. It didn't feel like it was going to work. 
the story as I was writing it just had this feeling to it that I was really enjoying putting down on paper and I felt like if I changed it to the UK everything would become smaller in scale and just not as interesting. So after I vented for a couple of days to Haley, obviously didn't say anything to the literary agent whatsoever because you know why communicate, I thought all right I'll change the first chapter, I'll see how it goes, what it feels like, I'll just try it. It was okay. I didn't love the idea in the same way anymore but I liked it, it was all right. Again, alarm bells. In hindsight, didn't see them. I sent it off to the agent and the agent said, yeah, this works, finish the rest of the book. So I thought, okay, this isn't gonna be the same book that I thought, but it's still gonna be a finished book that is crime, that is interesting, that maybe I can be proud of. And the thought that really motivated me to write this was that it was better to have a book that I liked, that was publishable and could be sent out there, than it was to have a book I really loved but wasn't publishable just sitting on my hard drive because I really took her word for it and assumed that it wasn't publishable. So I sacrificed my vision for the story. I changed characters, I changed the scale dramatically, I changed the plot. I changed a lot of stuff actually. I made it pretty much unrecognisable as a novel. The only thing it had in common with that first book was that I had written it. The rest was totally different. But after a few more months of working really hard every day on it, I finally finished it. This was going to be it. I finally had a crime novel that I was happy with and I had an agent waiting for it, ready to send it out to publishers. It was going to get published. This is where everything was going to begin. I sent the first draft off to the agent and I sat back looking at all my hard work and I kind of took a moment and it felt good. She hated it. Yeah. I couldn't have been more dejected. I didn't want to keep working on this book and I just didn't want to try and fix everything that was wrong with it or that she said was wrong with it. Which was useful really, because she didn't even suggest I try. Instead she said, let's have one more shot at this, what else you got? What I had was a novel that I'd begun writing in the second person. I've mentioned it before, wasn't good at all, but I sent it. Didn't take her long to get back to me on that one. I was walking into work early one morning, email went off, there it was. She'd read it, and what she said was, yeah, I don't think I'm the literary agent for you, uh, so good luck with your future endeavours. That'll be that. So I was back to square one, the same place I'd been when I finished my first novel, in terms of publishing prospects anyway. This whole situation, the whole back and forth with the agent, had gone on for a couple of years, and by the end of it, when I got that email, I felt a couple of different ways about the whole thing. I was quite disappointed, of course, because I felt like I'd had the opportunity to get published and I'd cocked it up. But I also felt a bit annoyed. I also felt a little bit irritated and like I'd been strung along for two years and ended up with nothing out of it. But most of all, I really just regretted changing that second book. Changing it to a UK setting lost all of the magic from it. Everything that I was excited about went out the window and I was left with a book that I didn't even really recognise. I had written it not because I was enjoying it and because I thought it would make a great story, but because I thought I could get it published. And I learned from that experience that doing that does not work for me. There are self-published authors that write a huge amount of books. They write books really quickly because they're targeting specific trends that are going on, and they try to get those books as high up in the Amazon bestseller rankings as possible. That might work for them. I have no interest in that. I realised through the process of changing that book that for me to write something that's going to feel good at the end, that I'm going to think is worth something, I need to be excited about it. I can't just be completing a task, I need to be interested in what I'm trying to do with it and excited about the story that I'm trying to tell, otherwise it just comes out grey. I've always wondered what would have happened if I'd have said no. No, I'm not changing the setting, this is the story I want to write. If I'd have had the confidence or the arrogance, which is what it felt like to me then, to just say no, keeping it my way. I'm pretty sure the agent would have just said, okay, well, thanks, on your way then, and that would have been fine. But I wonder if the book would have been better if I'd have finished that book that I always wanted to write rather than the other version that I really didn't. I wonder whether it would have been a better book and good things might have come my way from that instead. Or maybe I just would have been happy with it, which probably would have been good enough for me. The lesson that I learned was that I should have stuck with my vision of the story instead of trying to change it to write somebody else's. That's why if you've ever had me critique your writing, which a few of my subscribers have now, you'll notice that I always say, 
If my feedback doesn't align with your vision of the story or what you want to do with your story, feel free to disregard it in a hurry. Overall, I don't really have any regrets about the whole failure to get published thing because it actually taught me where my priorities should be with writing. It should be with the story, not with what might come from writing it. Since then, I've made sure to write stuff because I love it, not because of where it might get me. And that might not be a great model if I'm trying to get traditionally published in the future, but I really don't know if I am. This was a bit of a diversion from my normal type of content, but hopefully it was still valuable to someone. Don't forget to join the Discord community if you want to, there's a link in the description for you. My aim with this channel is to support other writers and to help them develop their writing as I develop mine. I want to help you tell your best story, so if that sounds useful and you want to be a part of that, hit the subscribe button below for more videos like this every week. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one.